Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning to some and good evening, potentially, to some as well. Um, thanks for coming. I'm really, really excited today. Um, we have a great webinar. We're going to be talking about inside sales and outside sales and what's going on with, um, you know, during the pandemic, after the pandemic. So I think we have a great conversation today, and I'm so happy to have um, Neil, Neil Benedict here today. Um, Neil, for whoever doesn't know him, is the founder of Silverbrick Sales Solutions, which is a sale, Sandler sales training partner. Um, Neil is also an author. Um, so he's been responsible for multiple startups as well as um, an advisor for early stage companies. And, um, you know, Neil and I have known each other for probably uh, a few years now. Years and now. Uh, this is uh, definitely well overdue, but uh, I'm so happy to have you here, Neil, today. And I know, you know, prepping for this, we are both very passionate about sales. And I think we have a great lineup of, uh, of questions and points to go through today. And uh, just for everyone, I, this is recorded, um, but we want you guys to ask questions. We want to make this as interactive as possible. So please don't be shy, ask any questions, and Neil and I will try and get to them throughout the presentation. But without further ado, uh, Neil, thanks for coming on. Yeah, this is great. I love it. I love this topic. I love the fact that we've decided to uh, to invite people in to also talk about it. And um, it's important to me, and it's important to a lot of our clients, the idea of inside versus outside sales. And and again, I'm glad that we are you know b building a small forum to at least have the conversation. Yeah. So I, I guess you know just to start off, I, you know, I'm going to ask you, um, you know, what has changed? between inside sales and outside sales, I would get, you know, from January of this year to now, like in, in your opinion, what's changed the most? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think the biggest thing that's changed is that most of us that were considering ourselves to be professional outside salespeople by default have been transitioned into somewhat successful inside salespeople in the sense that, you know, our behaviors have changed dramatically. They've had to the types of things that we consider important have changed. They've had to, and the things that our clients probably get from us normally and that the things that they feel are critical to be engaging around related to, you know, inside versus outside and how they want to interact with salespeople in general have changed. So I think, I think, um, you know, COVID has forced us into, into an environment where we really are looking at how to be as, efficient as we can be and and simply the fact that they there's not a lot of people who are open and willing to meet with an outside sales rep at least at least not broadly um, has has really caused us to think about this topic and and try to figure out not only as individual salespeople but as sales leadership and as company owners how do we how do we best optimize our sales force for not only what's happened in the last six months but what may happen you know out into the future yeah now, you know, in speaking about that, like I know one thing that I found was really interesting is, you know, the channels that people were using, say, eight months ago versus today, because, you know, you know, nowadays you, you can't go in and have a list of phone numbers and start calling in businesses when, you know, 60, 70, 80 percent people are working from home. So I think, you know, you know, if you have a direct dial, yes, you can probably get a hold of the person. But like, where do you see the different channels? Do you see more people going to like social media like LinkedIn or using email as that number one channel now that obviously you can't reach someone at a business phone number. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, certainly if you look at the LinkedIn numbers, you know, as far as usage for prospecting over the last six months, they're up dramatically 30, 40, in some cases, 50%, depending on what part of that you're measuring. Um, there, there's been a lot of uh, approaches where um, people have been looking at alternate technologies where, you know, texting, for an example, has largely been off limits in a B2B selling environment. You know, there are organizations that are now ex doing much more, maybe not um, volume experimentation, but some limited amount of experimentation with things like texting. Uh, when you do have those direct phone numbers, clearly email, um, email has picked up um, a lot of people, you know, even look at a business like auto closes business, the amount of people that are now understanding the benefits of sequencing emails and understanding the need to be consistent in that regard, um, you know, has, has really dramatically changed. And the people who are looking at automation, um, you know, automation's a, a sticky subject because in sales, you know, there are a lot of sales gurus who will um, who will not be very pleased at um, the, the automation that's happening in the selling world, but 
you know, there are a lot of people who realize that, you know, in this environment, you know, automation is one way to, uh, to manage your daily activities so that you can be as productive as you possibly can be. So I think that's changed dramatically as well. Just people's the sales professional, uh, particularly outside salespeople's view on automation, I think has changed dramatically in the last six months as well. So, I mean, I think all these things are happening. Um, you know, we still do a lot of coaching around snail mail, how to write a, a, a good snail mail. But to your point, you know, those things are possibly going and sitting in someone's inbox for two, th you know, two or three months until they come back to the office as well. So it's not a clear line of sight, but at least, you know, we've heard a lot of people who are getting their mail forwarded to their home address, et cetera. So again, there's, I don't know if there's a silver bullet, but certainly there's been a lot of transition in the way people view um, automation, technology, the need to use it more effectively. So, you know, talking about content, actually, so this is what is an interesting one that I found was a lot of people in their content and, you know, analyzing all these emails throughout COVID, you know, that's what we did at AutoClose and we were researching it. A lot of people would actually mention the pandemic and COVID inside of their sequences. I'd love to get your opinion on, you know, is that something that if, if you were coaching somebody or an inside sales rep or an outside, when they're sending an email to mention it, or is it something like, like, do you, should you embrace COVID or should you use it as like a negative factor in your email? I'd love to get your opinion on what you think um, the way salespeople should be um, looking at that when they're writing their emails. Yeah. Well, I, I certainly have an opinion like a lot of people do on this. And, and I think, you know, it goes back to the old adage, if you're, um, you know, we don't have these much anymore, but if your grocery boy is telling you, you know, to invest in the stock market, it's probably time to pull your money out, right, of that market. So um, I think, you know, it, early on, it was really important to highlight or not gloss over what was happening in the world, right? Not yeah. ignore it as if we were salespeople that were living, you know, under a rock. So I think initially addressing it in some way was important. However, now it seems like it's become much more of a, you know, selling technique. We salespeople are smart and we pick up on things really quickly. And, you know, we start using things in volume, you know, fairly dramatic, fairly quickly as well. So I think it's turned into almost a, a negative in the sense that, again, we're, if we're using it as a selling tactic or a selling ploy, then it's lost all its muster already. And it's, it's lost the, um, the ability to have an impact. If you're still concerned about your clients, and you haven't talked to them for a while, if you really um, don't know their current status, and if you're really interested in that, I would recommend, you know, certainly having that conversation. But, um, but I, I, now I think it, it, it probably doesn't really do much for you. And it may detract from your overall message if you're, if you're including too much COVID language or com too, talking too much about that particular issue. Yeah. And, and I know, I know for me personally, I always like to do everything in, in my life and everything in sales. I always like to do everything outside of the norm. So mm -hmm. if, if somebody's, you know, cold prospect me, I got 25 emails today, 24 of them saying, hope you're doing well through in these turbulent times, hoping you're okay during COVID, but you're that one person that just doesn't, you know, talk about it. I think you really stand out. So I think we were talking about this actually, I think it was yesterday, you know, when we were just having a quick call and how I found that the most successful thing that our team actually did was use COVID and but build a story around it. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by a story was, Find out some way that, you know, an inside rep or an outside rep can use COVID and figure out a story that might resonate with their audience. So I know, you know, for example, AutoClose, we sell a sales engagement tool and, uh, and the goal is to help you fill the top of the sales funnel. And during these, this pandemic and during this crisis, people might not be having the money to spend the revenue, but, you know, the importance of continuing to prospect, continue to fill that top of the sales funnel, because at some point, you know, it's going to either either be the new norm or slow down. And if you stop filling that top of the funnel, you might go into 2021 with no prospects. So uh, I know you, you were passionate about this and we we're talking about this, but um, you believed in the storytelling situation as well. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, they, they've done the research, right? Stories really resonate with people. We know that people buy emotionally. They tend to engage with information emotionally. They tend not to remember lots of uh, statistics or product um, details when you're, when you're sharing really, um, you know, technical details of what it is you do. So those things really don't, don't necessarily encourage a buying decision. They're necessary in the selling process, but, but stories resonate with people and, and particularly they, you know, things that other people are doing that look like them resonate a lot. Um, so if, if, when you're, when you're talking to, you know, business owners about, 
you know, how others that look like them have responded to this. And in, in, in there are only certain ways people have ever or ever respond to a crisis. And, and there were certain only ways that people were responding to COVID. But when you talk about, you know, again, a business that was looking a lot like them, and you tell the story of what that business did to, to either transition, make a bit of a shift, continue to focus on doing the right things over the course of the last, you know, six to six to eight months, um, then it certainly does have a, an ability to resonate much more than, um, again, just a, you know, how, how, how's COVID worked out for you? What, you know, what have you guys done? You know, not that those are unimportant, but again, the stories really matter for people during this yeah. time frame. And I, I know there's one thing that you actually brought up to me, which I didn't know, was that 70% of decision makers prefer the first contact to be made virtually. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, let's just say, you know, if you were going to tell the audience the best way to get that decision maker on the phone, um, you know, I, I know virtual is one thing, but is there like, um, you know, what I'm trying to go is like different channels. I know you can't really do the dialing as much. So I know you personally are on LinkedIn. You're very active on LinkedIn. You engage mm -hmm. on LinkedIn. You also use email. What would you recommend to people if they really want to get that first contact with the decision maker? And what process would be would it be you know virtually first and then what? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, if you think about the different channels we have to people today, they haven't changed dramatically. They're just maybe heightened in some cases. So you know, there, I don't know if you know Tibor Shanto. He's in your your neck. Oh yeah, oh but yeah. Tibor is a really uh, interesting guy. Does a lot of data research, particularly around things like. Um, you know, prospecting. He's a, he's a, if nobody knows who Tibor is, they should, because he's a, he is a very valuable resource, but, you know, he's done some research around, you know, the trifecta of getting engagement, right? And his trifecta is LinkedIn, the phone and email, those three things together. Um, we know, we know email has what an average 4% response rate. And that doesn't necessarily mean, a, and you know, you, we can improve that with tools like auto close, but on average, most people are getting about a 4% response rate. And that's not necessarily a positive response either. Right. So um, phone calls right now, 80% of calls, as you, as you know, are going to voicemail at this point, right? 80% of outbound calls. So you're only getting roughly about 20% that aren't. And then, um, and then of course, LinkedIn, you know, that's, that's sort of all over the map, depending on your approach, but you know, so engagement levels or any one of those channels tend to be relatively low. But if you can figure out a way, you know, to combine those three channels into a effective outreach strategy that, you know, people are going through your cadence of outreach, um, you know, Tibor saw somewhere close to about a 35% engagement, you know, using, you know, the trifecta of those three things that we really talked about. So um, his data, not mine, but my experience tells me something very similar that the cadence that combines at least those three things. And, and actually Tibor went as far and said, look, I've, we've added other social media outreach to it and it actually decreased the percentage interaction or decreased that 35%. It made it, it, made it smaller if we added another um, social media outreach to that, for an example. So again, um, I found very similar approaches towards making sure that I've got a, a well-defined cadence and that I put the people in the cadence in the right way. And those are probably the big three, but I'm, you know, I'm still doing things like um, snail mail and believe it or not, every time I call somebody, they say, Hey, thanks for the card. Right. I really, really appreciated it. Um, so very few people have not received the card, um, you know, at this point. So they're, they're at least showing up at their office once a week, maybe going through their mail and doing some other things. So I'm having some success there as well, but I would, I would definitely say that, you know, Tibor has done the research research and he's a, he's a great resource. And, and uh, indicates that those three are have those three in a, in a in a cadence would work really well. Yeah, and uh, funny you mentioned Tibor. So I've actually been on Tibor's podcast, and I've actually met him a few times for coffee here in Toronto as well. Okay, yeah, good. Uh, he has he's definitely a wealth of knowledge. And I know I know personally what what I've been you know helping our sales team do is in those sequences. What we find is very useful is after you reach out to somebody, connect with them on LinkedIn. But don't just connect to connect. You like LinkedIn, you have to provide value. So if you somehow get connected with them at that point, you could start using different things like commenting on their posts and engaging with them. You can like and endorse them because I always say LinkedIn is like a intangible touch. Mm -hmm. You can do things and get in front with them without actually calling them or emailing them. But I will tell you in that sequence, when you send that third, fourth, sixth, seventh follow-up email and they say, Oh, Neil, I remember he commented on my LinkedIn post. We had a conversation on LinkedIn. When you send that email or that cold email, I'm more likely to reply because Neil has already been in my head because I've seen sure. him so many times on LinkedIn. So 
Um, I also say every, everyone on LinkedIn is going to either buy your product, is going to sell to you. So they all have a LinkedIn profile. So there's a lot of people in that network. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, um, I, I know we, we've been talking a lot about prospecting. I'm wondering if we need to talk a little bit more about the inside versus outside sales. I mean, I, you know, I think that's um, probably an area that, you know, again, I think most people um, are probably interested in hearing about. So one of the things that was interesting in my research, you know, and, and Sean, I'm, I'm hopefully I'm not throwing you off here, is that, you know, the, the transition from inside or outside to inside sales has been real over the yeah. last six to eight months, right? It's been a real transition, yeah. whether you've, whether someone's changed your job title, whether or not you were, you know, hired to do one thing and now you're doing something else. Um, so the, the real, it, it's been real for people. And I think the idea is really, you know, what, what do people need to do to effectively transition from an in, uh, really what has largely been an outside role to an inside sales role, right? And, and a lot of us struggle with that because we, you know, we, we, we weren't particularly good at the phone for an example, right? Yep. You know, so we weren't really, you know, as an outside sales rep, overly concerned about making our outbound phone calls because we spent a lot of time either spending time in the field, having meetings with people, and, you know, those meetings were enough. They were sufficient. So, you know, so we're talking maybe volume versus quality of activities, but how do we, how do we increase the volume, for an example, right? That's one thing probably an outside sales rep is going to struggle a little bit, bit transitioning to inside. inside. Um, the ability to effectively use tools. You know, you're, you're a prime example of that with AutoClose, right? How do, how do we transition? The outside sales reps typically weren't doing a lot of sequence emails. And again, I'm speaking broadly. So if any of you are on the phone doing these things, um, you know, uh, that's great. But I think that people were, were transitioning from, you know, how do, I, how do I up the volume? If you look at all the data and statistics, you know, inside sales sends significantly more emails, make significantly more calls, significantly more interactions on social media, significantly more quotes going out, et cetera, right? So inside sales has really driven that volume and, and created a, a structure where, um, where outside sales benefited a lot from that. And now we've got to create that a lot of times for ourselves being outside sales transition or in, so outside transitioning to inside. So using tools. Um, you also need to focus a bit more on reading and writing because we're using because we're using um, you know, a lot of digital tools and because we're not getting as many face-to-face -face meetings, a lot of our interactions by default are gonna be you know, in written format, right? So understanding quickly how to interpret an email, you know, focusing on how to write it effectively in response is gonna be also a good thing that for you to be focused on. So you know, as we know, the art of reading and writing has largely declined you know, in the social media era as well. So we really need to, to get back to reading and writing effectively. And, the, and then of course, um, making sure that you know, you are structured from a time standpoint. It's even more important now to have a, a, a you know, whether it's time blocking or some other format to be able to transition your day. And outside sales, you know, one to two meetings, driving to the site, you know, all those things were built into your day. Now you're at home and, you know, it's easy to let hours go by where you're not being productive. So you've really got to plan your day more effectively and make sure that you're using tools like time blocking, uh, calendaring effectively, making sure that you've set those goals that you're achieving on a daily basis and make sure that you have a method to manage them. So again, those are some things I think you need to think about, you know, if you're transitioning most of your, even if your role is not really changing, but you're, but by default, your activities are, right? So, so Neil, would you, would you say that out, with outside sales, is it going away or is it just uh, a transition that people need to start getting used to the new norm? <laughs> Yeah, it, it's interesting, right? I don't, I don't think it's going away, um, but I do think it's, it's, we were already seeing prior to COVID a shift from resources going from outside sales to inside sales. We were seeing the shift, in some cases, a 10 to one shift where hiring for inside reps was, a, was 10 times more buoyant than hiring for outside reps. So, you know, I think HubSpot did some data research in 2019, and we were at a almost a 50-50 split between inside and outside reps as a whole. We've got over 5 million sales reps in the U.S. So about 2.5 million are inside 2.5. I, I would bet you a cheeseburger that the way people are functioning you know, now and the way people are thinking about investing in sales forces in the future is going to flip that number pretty dramatically by the end of 2021, whether that's 60% you know, inside, you know, who, who knows? I don't. But I think it's a dramatic shift in regards to the resources that are going to be applied to inside selling and outside sales, because, you know, to be quite honest, I mean, there was this, um, it's interesting, you know, Harvard Business School did a study back in 2013, and just so you guys can, I don't want to belay this, but 
um, there was a perception that inside sales couldn't do the work that outside sales did, right? That they were less experienced, less skilled. I mean, they even, let me quote this for you. Outside sales requires far more emotional intelligence, situational and awareness and planning. Our inside sales, while equally demanding, requires persistence, research, and back and work. Meaning that, you know, again, that was a, a senior executive's position on sort of the outside versus inside. But I think that's changed dramatically. If you think about way people view inside sales and what's happened in the last six to eight months, you can't ignore that, you know, inside sales has been um, driving a lot of revenue for companies. They've been driving big deals. They've been, you know, closing enterprise level sales. And we're hearing this all the time from our clients and we're seeing it in the work that we're doing where, you know, no longer did I have to spend lots and lots of hours on the golf course or out at lunches with the client. You know, we had very limited interaction and, you know, we closed, uh, you know, $1.2 million deal with them for an example. So it's happening and it's being more consistent, but outside sales is not going to go away. There's still a segment of certain markets. There's still a segment of certain um, client bases that require that interaction and prefer that interaction. So at the end of the day, we're going to let our customers drive what they want from us from a sales standpoint. Um, but all the indications as far as the research we're seeing and the data that we're seeing anecdotally is that, you know, they are just fine with the remote or the, the, the virtual interactions and in a lot of cases prefer them. Yeah. So here's a, here's a question I have for you because I know, you know, outside sales people, you know, they're used to taking out clients for dinners, taking people golfing, doing all that fun stuff that you mentioned. But now in this real world, you know, an outside sales can't actually, you know, go out and meet those people face to face. And then you have some people that are like, okay, well now I have to sell on, or sell on a Zoom, a Zoom call like we're doing today, a Zoom webinar. Sure. What advice would you give to somebody that say is used to, you know, being that person that could take people to sports events and dinners and golf, but now have to try and sell online and they might be going up against other people. Um, how can they differentiate themselves, I guess, and try and still close that deal or at least get that prospect? Yeah, yeah, it's it's not an easy question to answer, but we've always been believe, big believers that bonding and rapport, you know, with individuals had a lot less to do with, you know, how much do I like Sean? How much do I like him, you know, as a person? Uh, more about, you know, can I trust Sean? Yeah. Does he bring value to me? Is he consistent? Does he, when he tells me he's going to do something, you know, does he do it? For an example, we are, we were always believers that bonding and rapport were built not so much on, you know, likability is not, it, it is important, but likability comes, you know, with trust and trust comes with, again, you doing what you say you're going to be doing. And, you know, I think you, you consistently build rapport that way. Um, I think also, you know, we're big believers in, you know, trying to, to, to understand someone's business is the way to build rapport as well. Trying to ask really good questions, planning what those questions um, are going to be designed to get to and letting people know that, again, our, our primary purpose for building rapport is getting more details about your business so we can recommend the right solution for you, right? So we've always been big believers in that. And we've always focused on, you know, again, that consistency, that, you know, uh, building that trust based on what you deliver to the client, um, even in the first conversation, right? Or even in the first interactions. And then of course, asking really good questions. That's what we always believed was, was really differentiating us from building rapport versus the ability to take them to a sports event, you know, and and sit with them for a couple hours and have them like us. We just we just didn't feel like that was really ever the the differentiating factor between a really successful salesperson and one that wasn't. Um, not that those things are are not you know useful from time to time. We just didn't think it was the, the differentiating factor. So so I think you know again planning um, planning your questions really well is important. And also the 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 other thing too is being able to people have less time today and they have less tolerance with spending time on zoom yeah. than they even do in person, right? In person, I can do a little razzle dazzle and I can distract them a little bit and I can get them off on a tangent or, you know, all the things that humans do with one another to build, you know, that, that happen when we're together. It just doesn't happen so much during zoom and people have less tolerance for it. So make sure that when we're on zoom, for an example, we're very structured. We understand, they understand why they're there. You understand why you're there. You understand what you're going to talk about. They understand when they're getting off and they understand what the outcome needs to be at that meeting, both from their perspective and yours, so that you can run that meeting as efficiently as possible. They're getting what they need out of it and that, um, and that they see you as someone. We, we, as a, we have a reputation in sales of wasting people's, a lot of people's time, right? And the biggest thing we want to avoid on, in the Zoom era is wasting people's time. So if we, we structure ourselves effectively, we'll avoid doing that. Got it. And I know, I know one thing, like 
I know one, well, I, I, I know you've mentioned a few ways that to transition from an outside to an inside. I know one yeah. thing that I've, I've seen is, you know, outside sales reps would usually do a lot of solution selling. Mm -hmm. They try and sell their solution. Whereas, yeah. you know, nowadays, you know, I guess post COVID or while we're going through it, it's more do the consolidative selling approach, meaning don't go in and just try and sell your product. Try and actually, like you said, I think trust is the number one thing because mm -hmm. I think what's going to get you, but going in and saying, for example, let's say, you know, I sell, you know, apples, but helping them find out which oranges they like, as well as consolidating on different products and tools out there um, will help you get the business. Because at the end of the day, if you can't meet them face to face, like you used to, you have to build that relationship and you have to build that trust. So how do you do that? You become more of a consolidative seller where you help them with their overall business and how they can reach their goals and get through this than just focusing on what the solution is you're selling. So I'd love to hear what you think about the difference between like the solution selling for the outside seller versus the more consolidative approach. Yeah. Well, I do, I do think that there was a, there, there's been a, an overall thought process related to inside and outside sales and they've been categorized and maybe, um, an unfair way. I think that there's been a transactional model of selling that inside sales has been maybe pushed into saying, hey, you guys handle the transactional stuff because you're just transactional. It's a transactional role. You're transactional people and we want you to deal with transactional focused clients, right? And then I think there's this other model that this relationship model that had been built and clearly we want somebody in outside sales that's, that's you know, handsome and beautiful that um, speaks with a silver tongue, that you know looks good in all situations, um, that can you know can be around and and simply make other people feel good. All of which, again, is not unimportant when it comes to selling. But but it's been this relationship versus you know transactional model. And I think you know I think a lot of people have been. It, it hasn't been just COVID, but I think a lot of people have come on board, particularly during COVID, and said, look, that's really not true. There are lots of there are lots of relationship builders that can continue to build relationship and in inside sales and run large transactions, yep. largely virtually, um, just like there was, um, you know, just like the just like the outside sales people used to do. So I think I think the the lines are much more blurred today between these transactional sellers and these relationship sellers, and I think um, I think people are seeing more and more that inside sales reps can be just as effective at managing relationships and maybe even building relationships as a, as an outside sales rep was with a whole lot less time spent on all the other activities. Um, and with a lot of efficiency built into that model. Right. So I do think, I do think that um, we're shifting uh, a lot elite, from a sales leadership standpoint and certainly from a, um, a senior leadership and a corporation standpoint or understanding that, um, there are efficiencies to be gained and we don't lose a whole lot necessarily on the relationship side of the, of the equation by having more inside sales reps. Okay. So, you know, I just came up with this in my head and I'd love to get your opinion on this. So, you know, we don't know what's going on, you know, in, in the near future. Now you, when people are hiring outside versus inside, do you think when sales leaders are starting to look for sales people, they're going to start looking for, people that have characteristics of more of a hybrid role, meaning they can do both outside and inside, or do you still think that there's going to be that separation between the outside sales rep and the inside sales rep? Because we don't know how long this is going to last. Yeah. Yeah. We don't. Um, you know, my intuition tells me, and again, um, this is just simply intuition, yeah. but my intuition tells me that we're going to be moving to much more of a hybrid model, meaning that, you know, we're not going to be chaining inside salespeople to their desks. Um, you know, we are as a, as a smart organization, we are going to take that resource and we're going to deploy it in the best method possible. If I, if I hire you, Sean, to be my inside sales rep, there's a certain level of trust I need to have in you that says, Sean, you know, when a face-to-face -face meeting is really going to be important for you to move this for situation forward or to, or to close the business. I'm relying on you to make that judgment call. I'm relying on you to, to figure out when you might need to make that visit in person and um, and trusting that you'll make the right call, right? And I think, yeah. you know, as a, as a sales leader, we want to coach other sales leaders to look at it the same way as well as, well as coach our sales teams to be able to look at it that way. Um, I, what, what we don't want is a wooden approach anymore to outside sales or inside sales. We want a fluid approach that says, what do our clients want, right? How do they want to interact with us? What do they need at this point? 
particular point in time that I can provide to them. And the great thing is most of the time they're not needing a face-to-face interaction, but sometimes they do. And so we as salespeople, one of the things we're going to need to be better at, um, and one of the things we're going to even need to manage our managers about is when that is appropriate and when we should be doing that, right? So I'm a big believer that, you know, the hybrid model is the right one. And, and, and honestly, a lot of outside sales reps, you know, have already been functioning in an outside, you know, or in, or in, a, in a hybrid role anyway. It's just, um, you know, they were probably hoping, like all of us were, that things would go back to the, the way that they were, and they probably won't. So um, we just have to figure out if our, if our title still says outside sales rep, great, no problem. Just look, now, now we got to focus on how to optimize um, our day when, when we're only getting, instead of, you know, three meetings a day, we're getting three a week, you yeah. know, in face to face, right? So, but I, but I do believe that the, the distinction between those two roles becomes less and less important for organizations and more and more, more and more focused. We want to focus more and more on behaviors, skills, attitudes, and how salespeople interact with the clients that we have. Got it. So I want to jump to some questions because it looks like we have a lot of questions here as well. So um, Beth is asking, what can we do to actually encourage clients to actually open yet another email? What would be your suggestion for that? Well, I mean, you know, you know, Sean, this is probably as equally, you know, good of a question for you, if not better. I but, I, but I think that, um, you know, from our standpoint, we're always trying to, we're always, I'm an experimenting, I, I like to experiment by nature, right? So I listen to people like Sean Finder, and I listen to a bunch of other people out there, you know, describing what a good um, email opening line looks like. Um, here are a couple rules, right? And you can tell me, Ron, Sean, if I'm way off base is, you know, is, Write something that, you know, you would open, right? Write something that would appeal to you, right? As an opening line, keep your email as a general rule, very short Yep. You know, because people will not read anything longer than two sentences. Um, make sure that you have a clear defined, you know, um, ask in the email yep. and, and, action, try yep. not to, yeah, and try not to make it a, a meeting at first. When you're emailing people cold and the first time they ever hear from you or asking for a meeting, probably not the best approach. I mean, not to say you never should do it, but it probably isn't the best approach. So think about what you're asking for and think about if I was on the end or other end of this, would I agree to that, whatever I'm asking for, right? Put yourself in the, in the buyer's shoes. And then uh, the, the last rule uh, is um, make sure that you write it in a way that's, you know, that it's uh, appealing to the end user, right? You know, try to avoid all the typical grammar, grammar errors, all the mistakes, that type of thing. Um, because people will, you know, a lot of people still, you know, point those out. So again, um, I don't know what the, you, you, again, your formula is probably, and, and your advice is probably better than mine, but those are the things that I look to do. Yeah. Right? And, very simple. and I'll just add to that. I mean, everything, you know, everything you said, Neil, is exactly it. You want to, um, one call to action. I would say he said a few sentences. I usually say 75 words, which is about two, three sentences maximum. Um, and keep your subject lines. If you want them to open it, your subject line is actually the most important because if you don't have a good subject line, they're not going to open your email. So I always tell people, keep your subject line between two to four, two to five words, because that's all they're going to see on their mobile device. They're not going to see a full sentence subject line. So everything Neil said was, was spot on. Um, he couldn't have said it any better. Um, yeah, one, one other thing I'd add, Sean, just to do real quick is, is don't use any of the, 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 the tricks that people use. Don't, don't type RE, you know, as, as, as a response in your email. Don't try to trick people because, you know, that will backfire on you every time. And that's not what we do in sales. We don't, we don't try to trick people into opening our emails. We try to create uh, relevant content for them to, to read and understand and, and act upon. So just, just be careful. Don't, don't, don't fall into these traps of trying to um, mislead people to get them to do something. Yep. So we have Steve. Uh, can you comment on the fundamental change from field sales activities shifting from outside into inside out? And how long is a reasonable amount of time to give your outside sales reps to change and implement these new, very different skills needed to be successful nowadays? Yeah, maybe we can talk about the first part, the last part of that question first. Um, so I think, um, you know, it's going to depend largely on, I, I think, um, your perspective of your outside sales rep to begin with, right? How successful were they? Well, successful were they in the role? 
you know, when they transition. So I think that's your starting point. If they were really good at what they were doing, successful generating revenue for you and consistently doing that, then that's probably a different answer than if they were sort of on the margin, on the edge, not really, you know, doing as well as you thought they could be doing. Um, I think generally speaking, it's, it's a 90 day transition in general. I don't think that, you know, I don't think any of these concepts are, are going to be brand new to an outside salesperson. I don't think any of the concepts are particularly challenging for an outside salesperson to implement. I don't think anything we're talking about is going to throw an outside salesperson for a loop. It's simply the, the mental transition, the head trash in our mind that says, how do I become, you know, because inside generally was seen as a lower or a, a, a less, um, a less um, desirable role than an outside sales rep. So you're dealing with a little bit of this, you know, hey, I'm stepping backward. And I don't think that's actually true. I don't think you are. Yeah. But I do think you have to realize that could be part of a perspective that your team is going through. But generally speaking, I think if you have those conversations, we get that out into the, and, and air that out. It's, it's really a 90-day transition to get them to start engaging and doing the things that they need to be doing more successfully. So again, I, I, that answer would probably vary just depending on the individual. But um, again, on, 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 a, on a general transition, I would assume it's about 90 days. Okay. Adding to that, you know, for a sales organization, uh, organization going into 2021, I don't know if you've been able to answer this. What is the ratio of outside sales to inside sales personnel looking like in an organization, do you believe? Uh, well, I, I do think it's going to go up fairly dramatically um, as far as, um, you know, that ratio, right? You know, and, and if, the, if you look at right now, the research organizations that gener generally are large above, um, say, 500 million tend to um, lean heavily to outside sales reps, maybe 60, 70 percent towards outside and maybe about 30 to inside. If you, but that changes dramatically as you go down the revenue scale. So companies that are, you know, say sub 50 million tend to be heavily focused on inside sales resources versus outside sales resources in general today. Now, I think everybody's going to be making a shift, obviously, uh, a little bit more to the inside sales model. Um, and I don't think it's a cost saving issue so much, right? I mean, there's certain you know, there's certain probably CFOs out there thinking, man, I can, I can take all these high priced outside salespeople and move them to inside salespeople, pay them less, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I'm not saying that that isn't going on at some level, but I don't really think that's the driving factor because even if you look at the data, there's only about a 10% gap on average between, you know, the average payout to an outside, inside sales rep and an outside sales rep. I mean, that's average, right? Um, so there, there, there isn't a huge amount of cost savings built in there. I think it's going to be more around, you know, we want to be an efficient, effective sales organization. There's no way to be efficient and effective if we don't have um, metrics processes in place. And inside sales has always been good at driving towards metrics and they've always been good at, you know, organizing, you know, outcomes and they've always been good at using tools uh, to the, at their disposal. You know, if, if someone brings in a tool like auto close, the first place they usually bring it in is the inside sales organization, right. Um, and have them using it first. So, um, you know, these people are generally used to, to this type of, you know, environment and can adapt to it easier. And I think, um, you know, revenue is the driving factor. How do we get our teams creating as much revenue as we can? And right now, an inside salesperson just possesses a, a bit more ability to do that because they're, they understand volume, they understand, you know, the, the things we've been talking about a little bit more effectively than an outside sales rep has historically. Perfect. Um, so we have another question, then I'll get to you, uh, Neil, but Bob is asking, and I can answer this one, do you find different cadences for different industries or all the same? And, and Bob, what I would say to that is every industry has a different pain point. And in your messaging, you have to hit them with the pain point if you want them to either A, click or reply to your email. So yes, um, I would say if you're in the HR space, um, you, you're definitely going to have different messaging than if you're, you're prospecting to the manufacturing space. So yes, each one differently. Um, I always say the first three seconds of your email is the most important. So don't talk about yourself. Talk about one pain in that industry that you can solve in that first sentence, because that will get them to read the rest of the email. So now I got a question for Neil from Steve. How do you see the latest global spike in COVID-19 cases and shutdowns affecting outside sales heading into 2021. How will it be the same and how will it be different as companies of all sizes have had eight months of remote selling trial and error, increased technology using 
things like Zoom, auto close, et cetera, and increased inside sales skills? Yeah, well, it's a good question. And obviously I don't know, I don't know the answer uh, fully to it, but I do, I do think that, um, that a lot of companies are gonna continually, not necessarily be, I don't think they're necessarily worried about you know, a good percentage of their, their employees coming down with COVID-19 and you know, being out of work. I think that's not really been the story very much, um, but I think it's gonna be you know, protecting themselves against the legal risk involved with uh, opening back up again. Uh, and that risk goes up when you invite people that don't work for your company onto your company site and they get COVID-19 and potentially, you know, walk away with it for an example. So I do think, you know, depending on where these numbers go from a COVID standpoint, um, some companies are going to take a, a fairly hard line to it and say, look, there is no way that we can allow outside vendors in um, unless they do X, Y, and Z. And they're going to make the barriers very, very high uh, to be getting in and, and having those interactions. So I think, I think that's going to continue, particularly if the spikes continue. And, um, you know, there, there's really no uh, foreseeable end in sight to that today as we look at it, I don't think. Um, so I think, you know, continuing to refine what it is you're doing and how you're doing it um, you got to get really good at, you know, calling people. You got to get really, because, because again, you're going to get some people, right? You're going to get some people on the phones. You got to get really good at calling people. You got to get really good at what your voicemail is going to say and in how to get callbacks. You're going to have to get really good at, you know, finding in, in, you know, personalizing and individualizing your social media outreach, right? How do you use it? A big question for me is, and I struggle with this, which, you know, um, you know, I'm sure Sean does as well, is how do you, how do you use automation um, to reach enough people, but still make it personalized and maybe individualized so that, you know, people don't feel like they're caught up in your, in your um, grand approach to prospecting, right? I think that's a, that's a challenge we're going to have to work through as well. But, um, but y y you know, we're not getting away from the use of the, of the technology that's going to help us be in uh, better salespeople, but we do have to figure out how we as individuals use it as effectively as we can. And that requires study it requires practice. It requires coming to things like this and, and asking people like Sean, you know, what we should be doing um, because none of us are, are necessarily great at it and, and, are, and still need improvement. Um, so we have Tom asked, and this is, I mean, I, I think maybe a lot of people are asking the same thing in their head is we talked about statistics on, you know, decision makers prefer the first contact to be virtual. So he was asking, what do you mean by virtual? Do you mean email? Do you mean LinkedIn? Do you mean Zoom? So what is the first contact to get in front of that decision maker? Yeah, well, I mean, <clears throat> the, what I meant by virtual is any one of those, uh, uh, any one of those contact methods was where, where they had responded. I'm a big believer that the most direct and the, the best way to get someone engaged is to, if you can talk to them specifically. So my preferred method of primary engagement would be, you know, phone, you know, getting a, a meeting set up via phone. Um, and now we have the tool that's called Zoom, and that allows us to do that, you know, equally effectively as well. But I wouldn't ignore the phone because I do think that there, you know, even the phone can be more efficient than Zoom can because, you know, you just pick it up and use it. There's no pre-scheduling. There's no one, the person doesn't need to be sitting in front of their computer. And if you can, if you can make those calls and you can do them well and you can uh, interrupt somebody effectively, because don't forget you're interrupting somebody, but you're interrupting them when you email them or connect them on, on to, uh, connect to them on LinkedIn as well. But the phone call is the direct interrupt. So you got to learn to interrupt people really well. But that statistic was all virtual interaction, not just one method, but the phone is my preferred. Perfect. Well, uh, thank you guys. That was a very interactive. We had a lot of questions y'all. So um, I want to ask you, um, anyone that's here today listening, what is the best way they can either get in touch with you? I'm sure they could follow you on LinkedIn, but maybe if you can give them some contact information as well to email you, et cetera. Yeah, sure. You can, you can email me directly if you'd like to at neil, N-E-A-L dot Benedict at Sandler, S-A-N-D-L-E-R.com. Uh, it's my shortest email. And then, uh, of course, I'm on LinkedIn. You can connect with me there. Um, I'm happy to, um, to, to, to follow on the conversation. I've got lots of, I've been doing a lot of study and I've got lots of resources on the transition from outside to inside sales. So anybody who's struggling with that as a sales rep, any sales management on the line that wants to talk about it in more detail or in anybody who is simply wanting to understand how to restructure or potentially look at the way their organization sells related to inside outside, 
you know, just, just hit me up. I, I'll share all the research that I've gathered with you and give you a sense of where, um, where that research is t telling us to go. And it looks like somebody's asking for us to do a sequel of this in about eight months time after everything has changed a little bit next year. So we can definitely do this again for you guys um, in 2021. Um, obviously things might be different, but Neil, I want to thank you so much. You got, you gave a, a wealth of knowledge on outside sales and inside sales. And I think um, I can tell by our, our participants, not one person left throughout the entire presentation today, which is amazing. So um, thank you again. And we'll have to do this again soon. Yeah, Sean, thanks very much. And, and really thank you to all you who stuck with us and, and decided to come to this. Really, really appreciate it. I know you guys could have been doing anything else at this time other than being on this call with us. So, so thanks for sharing your time with us. Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone.